family, friends, and colleagues. Thank you for coming to the defense of my PhD from the ground up. I conducted my research into early Netherlandish paintings as part of the project The Impact of Oil, along with a team of art historians, conservators, and scientific researchers. Esther von Daun was also a project member. Over the past five years, the Impact team had the opportunity to visit museums all over Europe. We examined early Netherlandish paintings under the microscope and with non-destructive methods. Using these results, we could compare the technique of different artists or look in depth into the work of a single painter. We captured minute details using digital cameras with macro lenses. Some museums gave us access to conservation files, technical records, or samples, and we also obtained information from published literature. My background and part-time work as a paintings restorer helped me to focus on the technical and physical properties of the works of art. This led me to develop my dissertation topic, From the Ground Up, Surface and Subsurface Effects in 15th and 16th century Netherlandish paintings. The overall aim of the Impact of Oil project was to write a history of the introduction, dissemination, and development of the use of oil media in panel painting from around 1350 to 1550. Although we know that oil was used well before then, it's clear that around that time period, oil as a painting medium was exploited in new ways. Most early Netherlandish painters used paint bound in linseed oil. Some artists modified the properties of their oil by heating it, allowing it to stand in the sun, or adding other materials. When mixed with pigments, some of the properties of the oil medium are the possibility to achieve transparency or translucency, its fluidity, drying, or ability to blend, and the way it can be used to create textural effects. Because of the translucency of the oil medium, light can penetrate to the lower layers of a painting. This means that the layers beneath the surface can have an important visual effect. Each part of the layer structure can have a visual function when an artist exploits the properties of the oil medium. I'll briefly explain how each layer related to my research as we go through the layer structure from the ground up. Most early Netherlandish paintings were built up in a similar way, in a series of layers applied according to an established craft tradition. Of course, individual artists combined and layered their paint in unique ways. In almost all of the paintings we studied, the support was a wood panel. It formed a stable surface onto which the ground was applied, an even white layer made of chalk and animal glue. Some scholars have described how the reflective white ground is the source of the glow in certain early Netherlandish paintings because light penetrates through translucent layers and bounces off the ground. I question this assumption as it seems that some artists applied a layer of oil on top of the ground, which would have then turned it a beige color. On top of the ground, the artist then planned his composition by using a wet or dry material to apply an underdrawing. Technical examination methods like infrared reflectography penetrate through the paint layers and allow us to detect the underdrawing, but sometimes it is visible to the naked eye. In this portrait, the mouth and chin were drawn higher than they were painted, and now it looks a bit like a mustache. We can assume that the artist didn't intend for the underdrawing to show, but due to his efficient painting technique and the likelihood that the paint has become more transparent over time, it is now visible. I argue that there are cases where the underdrawing may have been intentionally visible. On the right of this detail, you can see hatching and cross-hatching of the underdrawing through the red drapery, and in another painting by the same artist, through a white cloak. Through the examination of the layer structure of the paint, and by making reconstructions, I argue that it's possible 
that the underdrawing might have been visible, visible immediately after he painted it, and perhaps he wanted it to provide modeling. My argument is strengthened by the fact that visible underdrawing can also be found in paintings by one of his pupils. On top of the underdrawing, some artists applied an intermediate layer, which I define as a paint layer of a single tone, usually semi-translucent, that is applied over the entire surface of the ground before painting begins. I explored some of the assumed functions of intermediate layers by looking at samples and descriptions of paintings that have such layers and by making reconstructions. Karl von Monder, the famous author of the Schilderbuch, described a specific type of flesh-colored intermediate layer called the primursal. I found primursal-like layers in paintings made in and around Harlem and also in some works by Hieronymus Bosch. In my reconstructions of the primursal, the flesh color acted as a base tone and made the painting process more efficient. The technique of 15th century painters like Jan van Eyck and Dirk Bouts has been described as being built up from superimposed layers. Within each color area, especially reds and greens, artists applied rather opaque underlayers. Then they applied thin, translucent glazes on top, which allowed the underlayer to contribute to the richness and intensity of the color. Some artists manipulated the glazes and upper layers of the paint to create surface effects. Oil paint could be manipulated by carefully brushing one color into another while the two areas were still wet. The slow drying of the oil medium makes these transitions possible. Some painters exploited wet-in-wet -wet blending when they depicted changeant or shot silk fabrics, which show a subtle transition between two different colors. Other artists did not exploit the translucency and blending properties of oil as effectively. We concluded that they depicted changeant fabrics based on a formula. A brush could also be used to create textural effects in the upper layers especially to make fabrics appear more realistic. In the top right, there are impasted dots of paint on the surface, and in the bottom right, the artist scraped into the paint. The upper layers of paint could also be manipulated with other tools. Some artists blotted their glazes with a cloth to make them thinner and more even, and this left a pattern of dots on the surface. Jan van Eyck used his hands for the same purpose, and hopefully the small dots that you see on the surface look a bit like palm prints. Here, he touched the paint with his finger. He also scraped into the paint with a blunt instrument. On top of the paint layers, a varnish was sometimes used to saturate the colors and protect the surface, like the support this is a layer that I discuss only briefly in my dissertation. An important part of my research involved making reconstructions using historically appropriate materials. Some reconstructions I made were illusionistic and others were more schematic. In some cases, I compared samples from my reconstructions to those from actual paintings. The cover of my dissertation also shows a reconstruction I made of a painting from the Rijksmuseum by Cornelis Engebrechts. I hope that this quick introduction has given you a glimpse of some of the subjects I covered in From the Ground Up. My dissertation is made up of an introduction, six chapters, a conclusion, and a CD with appendices. Several of the chapters were published as articles in peer-reviewed journals others appear only in the printed dissertation. I focused on the techniques of a group of artists, a specific aspect of the layer structure, and surface effects. I would like to thank all of the people and institutions who helped me throughout the project. I'd especially like to thank my primary supervisor, Jan Piet Philip Koch, and my polonymph and fellow project members, Esther von Daun and Dr. Mario Leinbol. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A word of welcome to you all at this special session of the doctoral board of the University of Amsterdam. And I would like to invite the candidates to read the first part of the formula. By virtue of the decision of the Rector Magnificus and the doctorate board of this university, I shall, during this hour, in order to obtain a doctorate, publicly defend my thesis, entitled From the Ground Up. All those who wish to raise objections to the contents of the thesis, I request to do so in a just and clear way, which leads to create the opportunity for an orderly exchange of views. Thank you. In the next hour or 45 minutes, you will be questioned by six opponents, and I'm very happy to announce the first opponent to you, who is Professor Dr. Molly Ferris, who is a Emerita Professor in Art History at Indiana University Bloomington, and Emerita Professor in Material and Technical Research in Art History at the Rijks University of Groningen. Please. Geachte uh, promovenda, esteemed candidate, Abby, uh, I want to say first that I very much enjoyed reading your dissertation. It was very well written, and you have a very uh, lively language uh, with which to describe the painting process. And in my opinion, that might be due to the fact that you have hands-on experience uh, deriving from the making of reconstructions. And I'm very glad to see that kind of argument come into uh, your thesis. Therefore, I'd like to ask you something about your reconstructions, and particularly as they relate to von Mander and his quote about the intermediate layer. We have, of course, very few primary sources for painting technique uh, it would be very heartening if we could believe what they say. But in fact, I think your research shows that uh, von Bonner is, in many respects, uh, hardly credible. In fact, his account is, I think, severely limited, and you've shown that with your research. Nonetheless, you still focused on one feature of von Mander's account, that you went on a quest for the rose or the pink or the flesh-colored intermediate layer. My question is this, what precisely did you learn in your reconstruction studies of white and gray intermediate layers that would have made them less effective in the painting process? That is, um, not only in not only as a flesh tone, a base for flesh, but also for whole compositions. Because I think you have to go beyond just areas of flesh, because von Mander implies a general function for this layer. But if this layer's effectiveness can only be seen or observed in flesh areas, then von Mander's account becomes even more eccentric. And given the prevalence of gray and white layers, why might I assume that the painters from this period considered those layers equally effective? In other words, what I'm asking is, did you notice any serious drawbacks to white or gray layers? Something that would have made them more difficult to work with? Something that would have made them less effective in the painting process than the so-called, the, the beige rose layer. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your, uh, your kind words and your thought-provoking question. Uh, first, I'd like to describe a little bit more about the flesh-colored layer uh, that we're discussing. Uh, Karl von Mander, in the Schilderbuch, which he wrote in 1604, specifically refers to a primursel, which is um, uh, an intermediate layer that is specifically flesh-colored. He mentions it's bound in oil um, and that uh, it contains translucent pigments or it is itself translucent in order to allow the underdrawing to show through. Uh, and 
he also mentions that it could act as a base tone uh, and help simplify the process of painting by um, giving a tone to begin with. Uh, so with my reconstructions, I uh, made reconstructions of various types of intermediate layers, beginning with isolation layers that contain no pigment. And the functions of those types of layers could be to uh, prevent the ground from absorbing more oil from the paint itself, so it acts as an isolation. It has a fixing function to fix the underdrawing because it's applied on top. It stops more uh, of the underdrawing material from being picked up when the paint layers are applied. White layers and gray layers would have a very similar function. They would fulfill both the uh, fixing function and the isolation function, but with the added benefit of providing a color. Now, applying an oil layer to the ground itself, I was surprised to find that it turned the ground a beige color. We often hear about the glow that comes from within early Netherlandish paintings provided by the bright white ground. But as soon as a, an oil layer is applied on top, then the color of the ground changes. So one advantage of a white layer, for instance, could be to reestablish the white tone of the ground. Um, and flesh-colored layers, specifically the ones mentioned by Van Monder, could be used as a base tone not only for flesh, but also for other areas of the composition. Uh, I mentioned in my dissertation some reconstructions of a painting that I treated in my work as a paintings conservator, a painting from 1530 by Jan Cornelis Vermeijen, in which a flesh-colored layer gave a base tone not only to the flesh, but also to the heavens in the background, to the clothing of the virgin, uh, and it sort of shined through and provided a warm tone. So I mentioned this warm tone as being quite important, but it also had a bit of a grayish tinge to it. And the primersal, specifically the flesh color that is mentioned, is often a sort of grayish pink. So I assume that it means that the artists were conscious to uh, begin the painting process with a tone that captured both the uh, warm tints of flesh and the cool tints. And that's how I return to the gray layers. Gray intermediate layers could, in fact, be an advantage in that they provided the cool tone from the start. And then the flesh tones could be built up in a slightly different way using warmer tones from the start. Uh, I think a good example is uh, St. Luke painting the Virgin from uh, the Franz Hals Museum, in which uh, Martin van Heemskerk paints St. Luke with a small, a small panel painting on the easel in front of him. And the painting that he is making, in fact, has a gray intermediate layer. And it's been suggested that the rest of the painting does so as well. So von Heemskerk himself used a gray intermediate layer, and he depicted St. Luke doing the same. I thought that was a very interesting way of showing his technique. But the technique that he used in the painting was, in fact, slightly different from that on the easel. But that is a, another story. I'll go back to your, uh, your interesting question. Um, the advantages of white or gray layers, as I said, could be to establish a different tone from the start, a sort of luminous tone to begin with. I, I would assume that white not only reestablishes that glow, but um, might also uh, uh, knock out the beige color of uh, an oil layer that might be applied underneath. And a gray layer, in the same sense, could provide a cool tone, not only for the flesh, but for other parts of the painting. Uh, any drawbacks to the white or gray layer? Uh, perhaps that um, we'd have to think about how to build up different areas of the paint differently than if you were using a flesh-colored layer. A flesh-colored layer uses a base tone, uh, can really simplify the painting process. In this painting I mentioned by Jan Cornelis Vermeijen, the uh, base tone was left exposed in the mid-tones of the flesh, and the artist needed only to apply the highlights and the shadows and blend them smoothly with one another to get a very convincing three-dimensional representation of flesh. Thank you. And I think that we have laid a ground, so to say, for the next opponent, and I'm very happy to announce him, um, Professor Ron Spronk, who is a professor of art history at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, Canada, and he holds the special chair called Hieronymus Bos in the early Netherlandish painting at Radboud University, Nijmegen. And I welcome here, him here at this occasion.
geachte Promovenda, uh, esteemed candidate. Um, thank you very much for writing such an eloquent dissertation, and which is also so nicely produced. It was a real pleasure to read it. Your chapter two is entitled A Translucent Flesh Colored Premersal Intermediate Layers Invisible in the Drawing in Euronymous Bosch's Paintings. With that title, and with the way you refer to Bosch throughout the text of this chapter, you imply that we are dealing with a homogeneous, coherent oeuvre painted by a single master. This is in contrast with the conclusions offered by Sibisma Ironside in our 1974 dissertation and by Fritz Koreny in his 2012 monograph on the drawings. Both authors recognize several different hands and distinguish between drawings and underdrawings executed by a left-handed draftsman, among which is the Rotterdam peddler, your case study number one, while others are executed by a right-hander, among which the Berlin St. John at Patmos, your case study number two. You know these publications since you mentioned them in your footnotes, be it a bit briefly. Could you discuss the findings of these authors in the light of your own observations? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your interesting question. Um, I'd like to mention that uh, since we're still discussing the Primersal, that Karl von Mander in the Schilderbuch specifically refers to Bosch as one of the artists who used the Primersal and who used it effectively, uh, in that he uh, allowed the flesh color to contribute to the effect of the picture, but also let his ground shine through. Um, and uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the coherence of the oeuvre of Bosch, or the, the lack thereof. Um, Obviously, there are several different hands, and the underdrawing has been one uh, facet that uh, some authors have uh, researched more deeply in order to attribute the different hands. What's interesting is that the, the uh, paintings I use as a case study uh, both seem to have primusal like layers, but as you mentioned, one of them is attributed to the left-handed Bosch, with hatching often going from the top left to the bottom right, and St. John on Patmos, you think more of as the right-handed Bosch from bottom right to top left. Now, what's interesting about my two case studies, the peddler and the outside of St. John on Patmos, which is known as the pelican feeding her young, surrounded by scenes from the Passion of Christ, is that they are both outsides of wings, as proposed by reconstructions of triptychs that may have existed uh, with paintings from various, that are now spread through various collections that go together. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that both of them seemed to have what resembled a primusal like layer, this flesh-colored grayish layer um, used as a base tone. Um, and in both examples, the underdrawing also shined through, whether it was the left-handed or the right-handed type of underdrawing. Um, in my chapter, I go into further detail about whether or not the artist intentionally intended it to shine through. That is another subject. But in terms of the handedness, I think that's an interesting way of perhaps dividing up Bosch's oeuvre. But I prefer to sort of connect the different parts together. The use of the primersal in both of these examples, whether it's the right-handed or the left-handed, shows that it may have been a more important part of his technique than we assume. Karl von Munder seems to suggest that he used it everywhere, but the results of technical research, um, much of which has been done at Museo de Prado, uh, suggested that the intermediate layers that Bosch used are much more varied, um, that at first he applied an oily layer uh, that did not contain pigments, and then on top he used different colors of um, under layers bound in egg very locally, and those could be white or gray or in a few isolated cases sort of orangish pink. Uh, but these outsides of wings, the two paintings that I use as case studies, seem to be sort of islands in that storm. So uh, while looking at the underdrawing may divide things up, I think looking at the premier result brings them together. If Professor Spronk is satisfied with this answer, I can announce your third opponent. And she is Dr. Mavison. She's an assistant professor in art history at also at Radboud University and a curator at the Municipal Museum of Alkmaar. 
Achte Promovenda. With great pleasure, I have read your thesis from the ground up. Your thesis is well written and illustrated with beautiful details, and it makes clear that restorers look much more carefully, and I may even say, look much better than most art historians. In your very accurate observations, and especially in the reconstructions you've made, lies the greatest value of your dissertation. Your thesis was not intended to give an overview of oil painting techniques in the Netherlands, but instead you have focused on specific aspects of the layer structure. And precisely this approach holds a risk. You have described many aspects of these surface and subsurface effects by different artists, over a long period of time, from the middle of the 14th century in Italy until the middle of the 16th century in the Northern Netherlands. The result is that your thesis acts as a broad collection of surface and subsurface effects in oil paint in late medieval and early modern times, and that the reader who is in search of the question of which effects occurred where and how, and whether these effects were influenced by each other, is not provided with a clear answer. And here we are faced with the problem that you, as a conservator, are able to observe very carefully, but that we miss the broader art historical context. For example, you choose one post eichian artist from the Northern Netherlands, Geertgen tot Sint Jans, who worked in Haarlem. You describe the surface effects Geertgen makes use of, and you've made beautiful reconstructions, but the art historical questions that come with it are omitted. To be more precise, the surface effect Geertgen uses are, in my opinion, very similar to the surface effects that Rogier van der Weyde uses. In fact, you even place these details almost next to each other on page 121 and 125. I believe these observations to be a bit superficial if you do not address the art historical background. For instance, the assumption that Geertgen was possibly apprentice to a workshop in the Southern Netherlands, in Bruges, where he may have studied the work and especially the surface effects of Jan van Eyck and Rogier van der Weyde. To conclude, you provide your reader with beautiful and a broad collection of surface and subsurface effects that are brilliantly described and illustrated, but the implications and art historical impact of all of this is slightly missing. Please give me a response. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your gentle criticism. <laughs> uh, I will first uh, refer to the, uh, the fact that restorers um, see better or look better than uh, art historians. I